So we're going to look today at what it means to be saved by his life, what it means to live in salvation. It's really the, the, the first level. We come into the kingdom through Jesus. He's the gate, and we've got to get that first level. We've got to get, the, we've got to get it right at the gate. Because if I don't get this right, I'm going to be walking in it with a limp, and I'm going to be trying to walk into the kingdom of God, and I'm going to be you know, dragging one leg around the whole time. And there's many Christians who are limping because they don't get salvation. Come on. So you've got to get this today. So I'm just going to preach, and you're going to come along with me, okay? I'm just going to go for it. Romans chapter 12, verse 11, Paul says, you've got to keep your spiritual fervor. Keep your spiritual fervor. And that's a word we don't really use today. But really, Dean's translation, what it means is that we've got to keep our hearts on fire for God. That's literally what it means. We keep our hearts on fire for God. That is so important. And so I'm going to get your heart on fire today. If you're a bit dry, you can get filled. Amen? So turn with me to Romans chapter 5. And we're looking in verse 6. Romans chapter 5, verse 6. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. I'll say that again. Romans chapter 5, verse 6. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. So this is Paul talking. And he says that humanity was powerless and ungodly. So I'm painting a picture. You've got you to come along with me for the, for the story today. Humanity was powerless and ungodly. That's what we were, okay? Paul's talking here about the state of humanity. This was the state in Genesis chapter 3 when Adam and Eve made their choice. What happened was they became powerless and they became ungodly. And that followed all the way through to the cross, which Jesus had to redeem. So ungodly, what happened? When Adam and Eve, all of a sudden, Jesus, uh, God says, you eat of the tree and you'll die. And we know that they lived on, didn't they? They're still the spiritual body. Oh, sorry, a physical body. So where did they die? They died in their spirit. That, so they became ungodly. They were still created in the image of God. They were in the image of God, but they lost their likeness. They lost their God-likeness. So it was the nature of God that had to be separated from them, and they were disconnected to the presence of God. They were disconnected to His presence by their choice. Paul says they were powerless. That, that Greek word for powerless is the word athenes, and it literally means that they were weak, they were helpless, they were sick, they were incapable of saving themselves. Complete humanity had no ability to save themselves. This is what Paul's talking about. From Genesis chapter 3 all the way through to the cross, we had no capability of saving yourself. You can try and do it without God, but you got no capability, no ability. They were stuck. Paul says in Romans chapter 5, he goes on to say that we were slaves to the power of sin and death. Slaves to the power of of sin and death. In other words, sin and death were, were, were reigning over humanity. Think of a slave. Just use your imagination right now. Use your imagination. Think of a slave. They have no rights. They can make no choices for themselves. They're completely ruled over. They have to do whatever their master says. They're completely helpless and weak. They can't get free. That's what, we, that's what humanity was. That's what we were, is we were stuck. We couldn't get free. We were slaves, and unfortunately, to sin and death. How bad is that? Not a good day, is it? It's not good when you're a slave to sin and death. And so this is a picture that Paul is painting, that we needed a saviour. This is his point. And this is what people don't realise, is that we need a saviour. We need a saviour. We need a saviour. Come on. We needed a saviour. We did. I'm, I'm getting this into you. We needed a saviour. Humanity needed one. I'm glad one of my favorite scriptures, Paul goes on, and he says in Romans chapter 5, verse 20, where sin increased, where sin, where death, where weakness, where our sickness spiritually, where we couldn't save ourselves, where that increased, where it kept increasing and increasing and all the evil in the world increased, he says, God's grace, 
God's grace abounded even more. God's grace increased even more. Come on now. You think about how bad the world was? Well, God's grace was even bigger. You think there was a mountain of sin? Well, God's grace was going, filling the whole earth to the heavens. You think sin is up to there? Well, God's grace is like a skyscraper, baby. Come on. This is the grace of God. And we think it was harsh and judgmental. No, no, no. Not at all. Where sin increased from Adam through to the cross, God's grace was abounding even more. And that's for some people today. God's grace is abounding more in your life. Maybe you look at the world and you think there's so much evil. No, God's grace is so much stronger, so much mightier. It's abounding so much more. You think you're stuck in sin? Well, I can guarantee you that the sin you're stuck in is no comparison to the grace of God that you're stuck in. If I could just grab you and shake you up so that you would realize how great God's grace really is. Come on. This isn't a fairy tale story. This is the truth. And it'll set you free. John chapter 8, you want freedom today? Know the truth. Get this. Grab a hold of it. Sure. Come on. I don't know if you've ever been sick before. But we can struggle with sickness in our physical body. And whenever you're sick, it's like you're helpless. You know? I'll be lying... I was sick at the start of the year. It wasn't, wasn't that bad, but I was lying in bed and I'm like, oh, sorry, Beck, you're going to have to do all the washing and the cleaning up today. You're going to have to cook dinner, unfortunately, and do the dishes. And Can you get me a tea or maybe a coffee, please? You're helpless. You, got, you, got, you can't do anything. Has anyone been like that where you realize that? Where it's just like, oh, I can't move. I can't get out of bed. I'm not feeling well. That's what humanity was like absolutely helpless. We couldn't do anything to save ourselves spiritually. But we thank you, God, for your grace. We thank you, Lord, that he had a plan. Everyone say, God has a plan. God has a plan. Come on. Paul says, look at this. This may blow your mind. Paul says in verse 6, at just the right time, At just the right time. At just the right time. See, the cross was God's perfect timing. It was God's perfect, perfect, perfect timing. The cross wasn't God's plan B. It wasn't His plan B. Many people think it was. Many people think, well, God was just sitting up in heaven. Oh, I didn't know that that was going to happen. Oh, quick, I better... I bet all the puzzles on the ground, I better put all the pieces back together really quickly. I didn't expect that. See, many people think, well, just God just, it was his plan B to redeem the world. No, 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 no. No. God is all knowing, God is all powerful, and God is everywhere. In other words, he knew it was going to happen. We, and we can't compute this in our brains. And this is where you have to be humble. A part of humility is that you surrender your belief systems to God and say, I, I don't know it all, okay? But God knew humanity would fall, and so Jesus was his plan A. Jesus came at the perfect time. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 says that the Lamb, Jesus Christ, the Lamb was slain before the foundations of the earth. The Lamb was chosen before the foundations of the world, and he was chosen and he was revealed to us in these times for our sake. In other words... God, before the earth was even created, chose Jesus to go to the cross for us. Get that through your head. It's incredible, isn't it? Before the world was even created, God chose Jesus to go to the cross for us. See, I I tell this to people many times. It's it's the whole point. Yes, God is all sovereign. He's all knowing. He's all powerful. But he has built the earth with kingdom principles within it. He's built laws. One of those laws is your free will. God will never violate humanity's free will. He'll never do that. Your free will is one of the most powerful things you have, your ability to make your own decisions. So that's why he wants us to be spirit-led today so that we'll, we'll make the decisions that he has for us instead of other stupid ones. He will never violate your free will. So he knows what will happen. He's pursuing us. He's saying, I want you to make the right decisions but he's not going to stop you from making a wrong one if you want to do it. 
He'll never violate your free will. So that's the whole sovereignty of God as we have to realize. See, Hebrews, uh, Hebrews chapter 1, chapter 2, Psalms talks all about this, that God gave man, the, the God gave the earth to man. He says, you rule over it. You take dominion. You multiply. In other words, God's saying, I'm not going to do it. You have to do it. You have free will. You go take dominion. You rule. You reign. It's our work. Now, he wants to work through us. He came and walked with Adam in the garden, but then he left, didn't he? So he wants intimacy with us, but he wants us also to go and take dominion. Amen? So we often ask God questions. Why, God? Why? Why, why, why? Why? John chapter 11. This is a, an incredible passage, one of my favorites. Jesus, he goes and raises Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus is sick. And if you didn't know, this whole passage of Scripture, it's a picture of what God has done for humanity. It's a picture of the whole plan of the cross. That's what it is. So we can pull some great stuff out of this. People come to Jesus and they say, Lazarus is sick. He's going to die. The world was sick. Humanity was sick, weren't we? We were sick from Adam through to the cross. Humanity was sick. We're going to die. Jesus says an incredible thing. This is such a powerful statement. He says, this sickness will not be unto death, but this will be unto the glory of God. Come on. You've got to stop focusing on the why of your problem. And you've got to start focusing on your solution, which is what God does. You've got to start focusing on the supernatural power, the glory of God in your life. Stop asking God, why? Why God? Why this? Why that? Why that? No, 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 no. This will be unto the glory of God. He's going to do a mighty work in your life. Come on. You've got to believe that. Lazarus is sick. Jesus says, no, no, no. This is going to be unto the glory of God. And he goes along. He says to his disciples, said, he says to his disciples, which is really interesting, let's go wake him up. He's asleep. Let's wake him up. That's what God said. He said, let's go wake humanity up. Jesus is going to come to the cross and we're going to get woken up. You were asleep. You were spiritually blind, but you're going to get awakened. You're going to be woken up. And his disciples says, well, if he's asleep, well, then why do we need to bother going? And then Jesus, he says, you didn't get it, but that's okay. So Mary and Martha they come along and they say, why, Lord? Why? 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 If you were there, he wouldn't have died. And many people have that question of God. If you were there, God, Adam and Eve wouldn't have fell. Why, why, why? Why, God, why? And this is where we have to be humble. And we say, God's given us the free will, but he has a plan. This is why the cross is his redemption plan. The cross is his plan A. And Jesus says, it's okay. It's going to be unto the glory of God. I'm coming, I'm coming. Lazarus is going to be raised up. He's going to be raised up. And so he goes along and he sees everyone crying. And, it, and everyone knows this scripture, but not for the right reasons. Everyone knows it because it's the shortest verse in the Bible. <laughs> Jesus wept and we all wonder why he weeped. I believe the reason he wept is because he knew it was the state of humanity. And that shows us the incredible heart of God. Sure. Oh. That when he was in heaven, he was weeping. He was weeping at the state of humanity because we couldn't see the bigger picture. We couldn't see it. We couldn't see that Jesus is coming to wake us up. And they couldn't see that Jesus is coming and he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead. And we were stuck in our sin and we're blinded before God. And we're like, why God? And we're weeping. But God's weeping is mourning because he knows we can't see. But then he goes, Jesus gets to the grave. Get the rock out of the way. Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus comes out. Amen. He comes out. He's raised up. And that's what Jesus has done. He's come down and he's raised up humanity. He's awakened us. Six main covenants before Jesus. Jesus is the seventh and he's the fulfillment. Amen. Come on. Six main covenants. And we all focus on that. And we say, well, we've got all these Old Testament all the covenants, but Paul says in Hebrews 10 that they were all a shadow. They were all a shadow. Come on, where's the shadow? Here's my shadow, right? You don't look to my shadow to see who I am. You don't look to my shadow to see my true reality. 
The shadow shows you where I'm going. The shadow shows me you are part of who I am. It says, okay, Dean's there. Dean's there. And it says all these covenants, the old covenant, it was a shadow. It was a shadow. Of, it, it pointed just to a tiny facet of Jesus. But the Bible says in Colossians chapter 2, when Jesus came, He was the full reality. The reality is in Jesus Christ. If you want to try and save yourself through the law, if you want to try to save yourself through self-righteousness, it ain't going to work. That's a shadow. It's just pointing to Jesus. The true reality is in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Come on. He is the true reality. He's the true reality. God planned it before the foundations of the earth that we would be one with Jesus. Come on now. That sin could not separate us from Him. He knew you would be here sitting here today and that's why He sent Jesus. Because He knew, He, want, he said, I want you to be one with Him. I planned it. I planned it. I planned it. I planned it. That humanity would be one with Jesus Christ. Come on. God always has a plan. Oh. If He can orchestrate the whole salvation of humanity, think about it. I'm pretty sure he can solve your little problem that you're in right now. God has a plan before the foundations of the world, his A plan. And if he can orchestrate that, then think of the problem you're in right now. And I'm guaranteed he has a plan to get you out of it. He has a plan to save. Come on. Come on. He has a plan. He always has a plan for humanity and he has a plan for you individually. Amen. Joseph in the prison, he had a plan to get him up to Pharaoh. Peter in prison, he had a plan to set him free. Paul and Silas, God had a plan and they worshipped. Daniel in the lion's den, God had a plan and he shut the mouth of the lion. Come on, come on. But see, here's the thing. You have to partner with it. Paul and Silas were in prison, but they had to worship. They had to worship God. They had to have faith. Joseph's in the prison, but he had to change his perspective of himself. He had to change his character. He had to grow. He had to mature. See, God has the plan. He always has the plan for your salvation. Always has the plan for every problem you're facing. He has a plan to save you. Amen? But we've got to partner with that. You can't just sit there on your couch and think, well, God, you just do everything for me. It doesn't work that way. He has a plan to save you. Amen? But you've got to partner with him. It's so important. Every area of your life, we say, yes, Lord, you have a plan. And that's why he gives us the mind of Christ so that we can partner with him and say, yes, Father, I'm going to worship you in the prison. I'm going to work on my character to get promotion. I'm going to do it, Lord. Turn with me to Romans chapter 5. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. Though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. Think about that. Though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. So Paul is saying, if you know someone who's righteous, or even someone who's good, your friend, your family member, someone who's, you know, done you a financial favor, someone you know who has impeccable character, someone you know who's amazing, like the person preaching to you right now, <laughs> you might possibly, you might, like, I mean, you might possibly, de- like, it, it's, a, it's an incredibly slim chance, Paul is saying, but you could, you could at least consider it, right? You could at least consider dying for that person, okay? It's a consideration. You consider dying for them. This is what Paul is saying. But, so here's the thing, it would be like you walking down the street and you see, you're walking along and all of a sudden you see someone get murdered. So you see someone get murdered, okay? And then Paul says, so follow this, Paul says, but while we were still sinners, we were still sinners, we weren't righteous, there was nothing good in us, remember? Nothing good, nothing righteous within us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. There's nothing good in you. There's nothing good in humanity. But Christ died for us. So it's like you're walking down the street, you see someone get murdered, and then it's a terrible injustice. Heartless, evil act, right? And then it's like you're going to the courtroom, you go to watch their case at court. They get sentenced to death, okay? The death sentence, right? 
And it would be like you putting your hand up and, and you don't even know the person. You just saw this, saw how terrible they are, all their sin, all the muck in their life, their, all this. And it'd be like you putting your hand up and saying, all right, you yeah, know, I'll die for them. Yeah. That's what it was like, but a thousand times more. Yeah. Because think of all the sin and evil in humanity. And that's what Paul is explaining here. While we were stuck, helpless, no good in us, no nature of God within us, we were powerless, Christ died for us. That is incredible. See, I'm trying to get, I want to get this into you today, the incredible gift you have, how much it costs Jesus, how, how much it costs God to send him to the cross. We just, we, we, we get the gift and we just treat it like a hundred dollar, you know, voucher or something like that. And we go do with it whatever we want. No, no, no. This is the most incredible gift in the whole world. This is amazing. Philippians chapter 2 says that Jesus, this is his incredible love. Jesus, he didn't consider his equality with God. He was God. But he didn't consider that something to be grasped, something to be held onto because he loved us so much. He loved us so much. He didn't consider it something to be held onto. But he came down to humanity. He clothed himself in humanity. And it says in that scripture that he came down and he, he brought himself to the point of a servant. So he came down to serve humanity. But that Greek word literally means he came down and he became a slave for humanity. Jesus became a slave for the slaves. We were in slavery. But Jesus became a slave for the slaves. It's incredible. He comes down. This is the work of Jesus on the cross for us. Stick with me here. This is the work of Jesus on the cross. He comes down and he's the suffering servant. He's the suffering servant on behalf of humanity. God says, you know what? I need a plan. I've got this plan, Jesus. We're going to restore them. They can't do it by themselves. So we're going to go do it together. Come on, I'm going to send you down. And he, this is such a cost because he becomes a suffering servant for us. Isaiah chapter 52 and, verse, and, and chapter 53 says that he was marred beyond belief. Beyond belief. Beyond belief. It means you can't believe it. Whatever you're thinking right now that he was marred, it was beyond that. So you're thinking that's pretty bad, unrecognizable. Well, it's beyond belief, so it's more than that. Just play with your brain, did I, or... <laughs> it's beyond belief he comes to the cross he gets spat on beaten whipped bruised Isaiah chapter, th uh, chapter 53 verse 5 says he was pierced for our iniquities he, he was he was pierced for our transgressions bruised for our iniquities the punishment the punishment that brought us peace with God was upon him and thank you Jesus for the bonus that by your stripes I have physical healing Amen. That's full salvation. Not just a spiritual salvation, but a physical salvation. Come on. You've got to grab a hold of this today. Get a hold of it. You've got to wake up. You've got to wake up in your spirit. Come on. Too many of us live out of our soul. How I'm feeling. Well, you know, oh, don't feel great today. Oh, Dean, that's a great message. But if you only knew what I was going through. No, no, you're living, you're living too much. You're being led by your soul. You've got to be led by the spirit. Come on. You've got to be led by your spirit, man. Come on, let your spirit rise up within you. Get a holy anger within you for what you're going through in life, for what the devil's doing in your life. Come on, rise up in your spirit. Start to contend. Come on. This is the gift. It's incredible. So Colossians 2.15, let me read this out to you. He forgave us all our sins, having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. So we were condemned by it all, but Jesus came down and took it all for us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. He nailed it to the cross. So where was it left? At the cross. When something's nailed there, it's left there. Come on. So stop focusing on, on the sin that's happened in your life. It's been nailed at the cross. You've got to move forward. Come on, you've got to move forward in the grace of God. See, condemnation, condemnation says, God, I've got all these issues in my life. I've got all these problems. 
and it gets you all self-focused and self-consumed. And so what it does is it actually draws you away from God. Conviction, conviction, which is what we receive through the Holy Spirit, conviction says, God, I've got all this stuff, but you know what? I'm going to focus on Jesus. I'm going to focus on the author and the perfecter of my faith. I'm going to get my eyes on him because he's paid the price. And when you do that, all of a sudden, instead of being drawn away from God, you start getting towards him. Conviction draws you to God. Come on. And you can't get free when you're away from God. Salvation is the greatest thing on earth. You've got to value this. will transform your life. Colossians 2.15, in that scripture, it then goes on to say that Jesus, he took it all for us. He consumed, think about this, he literally became sin for us. He consumed all the sin of the world, all the evil. He consumed that all upon himself. Now, I don't want to, this isn't about condemnation or judgment for you, but think about this. Think about just your sin in your life, like that's happened in your life, maybe the wrong decisions you made. And that's just you. Now think about everyone in this room. Now think about the whole world right now. Now think about all three, three, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 years of that. And Jesus, this is incredible, he consumed it all upon himself. He took it all. No wonder he was, you couldn't recognize him. No wonder he was so disfigured because it was a physical thing, but also a spiritual thing. And he takes it all upon himself And Colossians chapter 2 then says he took it all to hell. Amen. He wiped it all away. As far as the east is from the west, that's pretty far. The east can never touch the west, can it? As far as the east is from the west is how far he's wiped your sin away from you. Come on. Come on. This is the gift. This is the gift. And then it says he triumphed over powers, over the principalities, over sin and death. He triumphed over everything that we were slavery to, over the work of the devil. He triumphed over everything, all the mastery the devil had over us, and he made a public spectacle of them. He was laughing at him. Come on. He was laughing at the devil, made a public spectacle of the devil, (laughs) took back all our authority, and then he leads us in a triumphant brigade. And we're riding that today. Amen. Jesus, we're following him. And we're on, like, we're on his train of triumph. <laughs> and so what happens is when we, make, when we don't live in our authority, it's like we're jumping off that train and we're trying to operate outside of it. No, no, our job is to enforce the victory. Amen? Come on now. Someone get excited. <laughs> oh, goodness me. Romans 6, after the work of Jesus on the cross, he's done all of that for us. And he's resurrected. Amen. Jesus, he rose again in power, in triumph. And then Romans 6, you'll love this. Uh, you're you're going to love this. You're going to love it. You're going to love it. You're going to love it. Because Romans 6 talks about our, our identification with Jesus. We identify with him. How good's that? Yeah. Come on. You, you identify with him. You're united with Christ. You're united with Jesus. When you put your faith in him, you're united with him. Come on, someone get that today. Someone catch it. You're united with him. In other words, he renews you spiritually. He comes and lives within you and you're united with him. That means, think about this, that means his victory is your victory today. (laughs) You may not feel it, but his victory over sin is your victory over sin. His victory over death is your victory over death. His victory over sickness and disease is your victory over sickness and disease. Come on now. Woo! His victory over depression and anxiety is your victory. He's dead to it, Paul says. Paul says, Jesus is dead to it, so you're dead to it. We're meant to consider ourselves dead and then alive to God in Christ Jesus because we're a new creation. Amen? You're born again. You're born again. And you just thought it was some get out of jail free card. So much more. Come on. Paul says in verse 8, and this is so incredibly powerful, and this is really what I, what I want to get into you. It's so important that we value this gift of salvation. We value the work of Jesus. But then in verse 8, but God demonstrates, look at that, 
God demonstrates his own love for us. His own love for us, that Christ died for us. Do you get that? Do you get that? God demonstrates his own love for us. The cross was a complete, that word demonstration means it's like a tangible display, a huge show of God's love. That was the cross. The cross was an amazing representation and demonstration of the mighty love of God. So think of the biggest fireworks show you've ever seen. Imagine the biggest fireworks show times it by 100,000 billion million trillion and think of one firework in that fireworks show and that's the love of God. Well, times that by that much and that's how much a demonstration it was of his love for humanity. But not only, not just humanity now, personalize it. His love for you. His love for every single person in this room, but you personally. Jesus was thinking about you on the cross. He was thinking about you. It was a complete demonstration of God's love for you. You need to get this right now. The cross was a perfect, complete demonstration, a huge show of the love of God. And you thought God wasn't loving. You thought he was sitting up in heaven. He's mad at you. He's angry at you. No, no, no. The cross was the greatest demonstration. Jesus, him dying for us, was the greatest demonstration of the love of God for humanity. There's no greater love. There's no greater love. You need to get this into your heart today because many people, they never move forward because they don't encounter the love of God at salvation. This is so important to get. Jesus is our gate. And if we want to move forward in spiritual maturity and into the kingdom of God, if we want to step forward, you need to get the love of God right now. You need to receive this. So, so, if you, if you don't have a revelation of this, you've got to get it today. Be hungry for it right now. Okay? But the cross is the perfect demonstration of his love. So that means that the whole foundation, think about this, the whole foundation of Jesus sacrificing his life for you was the love of God. It was the love of God. It was the love of God. We've got all this legality thing going on that, oh, yeah, well, we needed... We needed uh, righteousness, we needed to get all this imputed stuff, we needed all the sin needs to go out, all that stuff and that's really important it's so important but if you focus too much on that and get away from God's love then you're missing the point come on, the cross was a show, a display of God's love, his foundation was his love, his deep incredible love for humanity so people get preached salvation and, and, and they get legitimately saved. That's why I know, I know that, that you believe in Jesus and you're saved. It's easy, amen? But this, uh, the gospel they get preached is, well, you just got to get out of hell. Oh, well, you know, even, and that's, that's great. It says, oh, well, oh, if you just receive Jesus today, maybe he'll heal your body. Well, that's great, isn't it? That's great. But that's not the reason. That's not the whole reason we should be receiving him as our Lord and Savior. The whole reason is that I receive salvation because I have an incredible revelation of the Father's love for me. Come on, for you. You need to get that today. Come on now. And incre- you need that revelation. The foundation is the love of God. So here we go. Think about this. Salvation begins an encounter, an experience, and a complete understanding of the love of God for you. A never-ending experience. That's what salvation should be. His love comes within you. The Holy Spirit comes within you, renews your spirit. He pours His love within you, okay? So that means that salvation begins a never-ending encounter with the Father's love. So I'm sorry if some of you have been robbed. If you thought, I'll just receive Jesus to get out of hell. Or I'll just receive Jesus because God's angry with me and I've got to get in His good books. That's, you're legitimately saved. I'm not questioning that at all. But what I'm saying is that salvation always, always, always should be a, a complete understanding and revelation of the love of God. And then we move on from there. And we move on holding on to that. That's our foundation. Amen. Think about this. Because some of you are looking at me 
and you're like, wow, this is new. Think about this. Luke chapter 15. It's an incredible chapter. And Jesus tells three parables, which is a picture of the incredible love of God. And this is Jesus. This is who he is, is that he's the one who leaves the 99 and he goes out and gets the one lost sheep. And he puts that sheep on his shoulders and then he goes back with it. You are forever on the shoulders of Jesus Christ. Come on now. This is Jesus. He goes out and he looks for the one. Think about that. Think about a shepherd doing that. That's actually pretty silly. Because what about the 99? What would happen to them? They got no one, there's no shepherd there for them. But this is the incredible love of God. This is love for you. Is that he goes out and he grabs you. Jesus gets you and he brings you back into the kingdom. Come on. That's what he's done for humanity. Amen. This is so powerful. And the Holy Spirit, or oh God, he, he's in the house. The, talk, Jesus talks about the woman in the house. And she goes and there's one lost coin and it's in the darkness. And she goes and looks for this lost coin. This one lost coin she goes and looks for and searches and searches and searches and doesn't stop searching. And you probably stop searching after about 20 minutes. You say, oh, well, it's just a coin. It's, it's a penny. I won't worry about that. A dollar coin, well, you know, I've got my bank card, so I just go use that today. Thank God he didn't do that. And he searches and he searches for you in the darkness. He searches for you in your darkness. And then he finds the lost coin. Come on. God finds the lost coin. And not only that, then this, the, the parable of this woman is she gets it. And then she celebrates with all her friends. She calls all her friends. So God, he found you in your spiritual darkness, in your death. He found you and then he jumps on his Samsung phone up in heaven because there's no fire phones up there. And he says, rings all his, you know, Michael the archangel and, and he, the cherubim and, the, and the, the cherubim, the seraphim and all the, people, all the ones up there. And he gets on his phone and he says, I found you. I found Amy. I found, I found, I've lost it. Kim. I found Kim. I found John. I found Craig. I found him. And he's celebrating up in heaven. I found you. I found you. Look who I found. Come on. This is the incredible love of God. It's amazing. And then the last one, which is, the greatest one is we've got the father and his son runs away. He says, I don't want to be with you. And he's disconnected from God. It's a picture of what happened to humanity. And the father, oh, it's, inc it's incredible. The power of God's love. And this son is wasted everything. He's wasted everything. And he thinks, well, I may as well just be a servant in my father's house because they get tr be treated better than the devil treats me. That's what he's saying, really. And he comes back and he says, Father, I'm not worthy. And the incredible thing is that the father, he's standing, waiting for his son. So he's not just chilling out, sipping on his coffee. No, no, he's waiting for his, he's looking on the horizon. And then he won't, vi remember, he won't violate our free will. But then the son makes a decision to come back. Picture this in your mind. The son makes a decision and he sees him coming back, the father. And the son comes and the father said, he says, I'm not worthy. And this is a, such powerful love of God is that the father comes and he says, get Get the robe for him, which is a picture of our righteousness in God. And he says, robe him. He says, I'm going to robe you. And the son says, I'm not worthy of it. I can't do it. And the amazing thing about that story is that he picks up the garment and runs towards his son. Think about that. For a Jewish man, that was completely undignified for them to pick up their garments and run. And it's a picture for us of how God became so undignified for humanity to restore you today. He became so incredibly, incredibly undignified for you just to restore you, just for the one. And the son, he re completely restores him. And he says, put the ring on his finger, which is a picture of Holy Spirit, our inheritance in Christ. Ephesians chapter, two, chapter 1, chapter 2 talks about that, about how he's like a signet ring on our finger. And this is what God has done for you. And you thought, well, God doesn't really love me. 
No. This is so powerful. Come on now. You've got to get this revelation. The Father hugs him and restores him and loves him and laughs over him. Come on. This is the love of God. This is God's love for you. The gift of salvation is so incredible. Come on now. You've got to grasp this. God's gift of salvation. Just get this. It'll transform you. See, salvation is meant to transform you. You're not meant to get saved and then just live the same. Why? Because salvation is an encounter with the incredible love of God. And then that love is living within you. And it's meant to continually, continually, continually transform your life. Where you go from glory to glory. Because you have a continual revelation of the love of God. There's too many Christians who are dry. There's too many believers who are just thinking, well, oh really God, is that you? And it's like, no, come on. You want to get set on fire for God? Then get this gift of salvation. Really get it. Get the revelation of it. It'll change your life and guarantee it. Whoa. Paul says God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. So some of you are thinking, this is really relevant for these people, for you. Some of you are thinking, Dean, this is all great, but I've never actually experienced this love you're talking about. And you need to experience it. But you're saying, Dean, I don't know this love that you're, saying, that you're talking about. Paul says, God's love has been poured out into our hearts through Holy Spirit who has been given to us. So he comes into our spirit. So think about this. This is how incredible God is. His love is already within you. His love is already in there. It's already in there. It's already in there. You just got to unlock it. It's not, it's not something flying up in the atmosphere. No, his love, Paul says, is poured out into your spirit, into your heart. And so it's our job to let that flow through our soul. And then it's our job to let it pour out into our world. When it gets into here, then it's going to get out into your world. So we saw people up here with testimonies at the start. And they had an incredible encounter with God. And I, I have at least one or two testimonies, which we might get up another week, of people who got healed in that fire tunnel. Who got completely healed, okay? And that's all the love of God. That's the love of God. That's His love, is it gets out of us. It's within us, and then it goes, it goes from our spirit into our soul and into our body. So there's people who are stuck, and you're stuck in fear. You're stuck in judgment. You're stuck in lies. Let the truth set you free today. You're stuck in lies from the enemy. You feel condemned. You feel like, well, if I sin, well, God's not happy with, or, like, or, or God, no, He doesn't approve of our sin, but He still loves us. It doesn't change His love for you. You think, well, I'm stuck in my sin. I must be further away from God. It's completely, completely so far from the truth. This is the incredible love of God. So powerful. You're stuck in depression. We get stuck in judgment. All this stuff. It's like, no, no, God's love is within you. Let it pour out. Let the truth set you free. Amen. And so the Holy Spirit's within you. And, he, and he's, complete, he's constantly at work. Think about this. Romans 8, 16, last scripture. Romans 8, 16, God's, uh, Paul says, inspired by God, this is the role of Holy Spirit, okay? That Holy Spirit testifies to our spirit that we are beloved children of God. Holy Spirit is completely, is always, always, always testifying to you today that you're a beloved child of God. Right now, He's testifying to you right now. He's, that, mean, that testify means he's whispering to you. It's called an inner witness. He's whispering. He's saying it to you. It's, it's can be quiet, but he's speaking to you. He's saying, I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. You're God's beloved child. I love you. I love you. I love you. Come on. Come on. You've got so much more. Come on. You got to trans, you, you're called to transform. It's the love of God that transforms us. And the Holy Spirit's whispering to you. And you're believing lies. You're thinking, well, God, I can never do that. Well, God, I can never pray for the sick. Well, God, I can never do this. No, no. It's all empowered by love. And the Holy Spirit is whispering you, to you and He's empowering you. I love you, I love you, I love you. You've got to respond to His voice. You've got to use that free will up here and you've got to respond to it. You've got to believe that today. Amen? Come on. Grab a hold of this. Paul says, if He loved us while we were sinners, last thought, if He loved humanity when there was nothing good in them, then how much more 
Will He love you when you're now a child? You're, you're a child, so how much more will He love you now? Come on. Let that sink into your brain. So He loved humanity in their worst state. So God has a different love for the world than He does for His children, doesn't He? It's even more powerful. And think of the power He has for humanity, the love. Now, it's even greater for you, His child. Come on. Come on. Woo! Thank you, Jesus. So ask yourself what you're worth. Because that will show you if you have a revelation of this or not. That will show you. And we all need to grow in this. But ask yourself today, what are you worth? What are you worth? Think about that. God, what, just think, how have I been valuing myself? What am I worth? Because if your answer is, well, maybe I'm worth, maybe I'm worth a car, maybe I'm worth a house, maybe I'm worth a nation. If your answer is anything less than the precious blood of Jesus Christ, then you need an encounter and a revelation of God's love for you. You are worth the blood of God. You're worth the blood of His Son. Amen? You're not, re you're not redeemed with the, with, the, with the blood of goats and bulls. No, no. It's with Jesus Christ. You get that. Get that today. That's your worth. Amen? Amen. Salvation is a continual experience of the Father's love for you. His love comes into your heart because of the work of Jesus on the cross for you. We were lost. Jesus comes, redeems us. He puts His love within us. And now, as a child of God, my foundation is I'm ever experiencing, have a revelation of the truth of God's love for me. And then that continually transforms me. Amen?